So as promised, this is chapter, this is the second PowerPoint um, in the 1999 uh, film, The Mummy. So this is going to be chapter two on the Thinkific course. Uh, so last class um, lecture, I gave a little bit of background info on the field of Egyptology and on, on its entanglement with what I call the isms. Um, now I'm going to go over a sort of summary of ancient Egyptian chronology and a little bit of hieroglyphics um, as well. So uh, with that said, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so now I'm going to in in show for Matt. <laughs> I just need to take a thing of water. All right. So as this says, uh, this is still sort of background um, information, but it's background part two, so chapter two in the Thinkific course. Um, so the first large topic that I'm going to go over is sort of a summary of Egyptian chronology. Um, per per particularly particularly um, for what is called the pharaonic period. So basically when Egypt uh, is in its Neolithic period um, or the geographical region that we now call e Egypt um, through when it's an independent state. Um, so this is this link up here is a longish video that goes into the chronology. So it's review basically for what I'm about to tell you now. So I'm not going to play it, but again, um, when you download this PowerPoint on your own time, if you want to go to that link and watch the video, you can. Um, so on the left here, you kind of see the highlights, some of which I've already mentioned. So as I was talking about in background part one, uh, with that timeline that I showed you, Pharaonic e Egypt, or the period when e Egypt is an independent entity, is a little bit over 3,000 years, so it's a long time. There were periods of unity uh, when the state was ruled by one family. Those are called, those have been labeled by Egyptologist kingdoms, and then you have the intermediate period, which, which is when that centralized authority broke apart. Within those kingdoms and intermediate periods, you have different families that, that hold power, and those um, are called dynasties. So that um, dynastic organization actually comes from a Ptolemaic writer um, named Manetheo, who is actually a Ptolemaic priest and he wrote a history of Egypt that has his original history has not survived but later Greco-Roman authors quoted Pope's parts of his work um, and modern Egyptology has stayed with that system um, of dynasties. Um, these kingdoms and intermediate periods um, are artificial to some extent so they've been imposed by modern Egyptology as kind of a way to order and look at these very long periods of time. So if you were to time travel, you know, if you somehow got that ability um, and you went back to what Egyptologists call old kingdom Egypt and, you know, ask a random Egyptian farmer, you know, how is the old kingdom going? Um, he, she or he would look at you with a kind of quizzical expression, because the kingdoms and intermediate terminology wouldn't have made any sense to them. Uh, so it's an artificial way of looking at these vast spans of time, but it's because these, these spans of time are so long, we basically have to have some way um, of, of, of agreeing, okay, we'll call it this so that we can argue about all the other stuff. Uh, so on the right here, you see the general periods in order of time. So first you have the pre-dynastic through the Nakata third, or which ends roughly at the Nakata third period, kind of at the end of that. So that's basically when you see the process of state formation and then 
little bit further back the Neolithic as well. And you have the early dynastic, which is when um, the basically the first couple 200-ish years or so of the state. Uh, and then you have the old kingdom, which is at least it seems like the royal family kind of held the most absolute power. At least that's what the archaeology seems to seems to tell us. Um, and then you have the first period of decentralization, which is the first intermediate. Uh, and then you have a second period of centralization, which is the Middle Kingdom, followed by another breakup of the state. Uh, and then you have the uh, New Kingdom. And then after the New Kingdom, there is a, a kind of a final span of time when centralized authority breaks up yet again. Um, and then following that, you have the late period, which is when you get Egypt, the state goes back and forth be between being controlled by a native dynasty, being controlled by foreign hands. Um, and then the late period roughly um, ends with the Battle of Actium uh, when Egypt becomes province of Rome. <laughs> Um, so this is from a, another website that I use a lot because, again, a great resource. So it's digital. The, the full title of the site is Digital e Egypt for Universities. Um, and the site is put together by the University College of London and Dr. Stephen Quirk um, in particular. So this is the timeline that, or part of the timeline that's found on the site. And... Uh, the reason that these are in blue or purple is because if you go into the actual site using this link here, you know, if you if you click on these further tabs will open up. But the main thing that I want you to notice with this part that I um, web transferred is the rough duration. Um, so if you look at, say, the Paleolithic period, you know, that lasts a little bit under 3,000 ish years. If you're saying, look, if you're looking at the Nakata one period, so that pre dynastic, that lasts about 500 years. If you're looking at the old kingdom, lasts roughly another 500. So these are basically, again, just re emphasizing that these are vast spans of time. Um, and this isn't even getting into the Greco-Roman period. Um, so again, we kind of have to agree on an artificial something uh, just because we're dealing with such long, vast spans of time. Um, one of the other things you know about the chronology is the further back you go, the less um, uncertain and kind of hazy the dates become because uh, the Egyptians in their primary documents and their primary sources dated things very differently than we do in terms of our absolute year calendar dates. So basically, the further back in time you go, uh, so, you know, old kingdom, middle kingdom, pre-dynastic, um, the less and less documents there is to cross-check those dates. So if you go to any Egyptology kind of textbook, and you see, you know, timeline or chronology, um, basically the dates further and further back are going to be a lot more uncertain. Um, and a lot, you'll see that circa a lot more for say the pre-dynastic through the old king kingdom through to about the middle kingdom. Once you get to the new kingdom, the dates become a little bit more uh, or a little bit less uncertain, but it's not until the late period that we have an abundance of documents from other cultures that interacted um, in Egypt and that were in Egypt that we can cross check those dates and get really firm dates. Um, so this is from that same Digital Egypt for Universities. And again, this is the timeline part of their page. So this is now going um, after that late period and it's basically following the 
different foreign hands um, that Egypt was um, under after that period. So it was uh, conquered by the by the Assyrians for a little bit, as well as the Persians. Um, and you have Alexander the Great comes and he overthrows the, the Persian Empire. Um, and so Egypt is kind of folded into his conquest. And then you have Alexander the Great dies. And so you have his general Ptolemy Soter um, that basically claims Egypt. And so that begins the Ptolemaic dynasty or the Ptolemaic period. Um, then the Ptolemaic period um, ends by or ends with the Battle of Actium in 31 or 32 BC um, when Octavian wins against Antony and Cleopatra and Egypt becomes province of the uh, Roman um, Empire. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about hieroglyphics and sort of the, the basics of kind of how they work. So this is from that digital e e Egypt for University site. Um, and it's just a chart that kind of gives you a, a timeline of both how the hier hieroglyphic language evolved and other languages um, after as well. Because there's different phases of the hieroglyphic, or there's different phases of the hieroglyph language um, and different hieroglyphs. Um, so most people, when they first start out, they start out by learning uh, what's called Middle Egyptian, um, because once you know Middle Egyptian hieroglyphs, um, you can sort of begin to figure out the old as well as the late. And then Coptic uh, is a form of the hieroglyphs that the version of Christianity that basically got started in Egypt in late antiquity. Um, it's the kind of the, the the version that they used for their church text and like for their sacred te text. So it's basically the the last surviving vestiges of hieroglyphs that were still in use um, in late antiquity. To some extent today, because I think there's still, I think there's still cops, there's still Christians in Egypt now. Um, these are just some good sources uh, for the both for hieroglyphics and for the general study of Egyptology, some of which I've already mentioned. So the Internet Archive, the Digital Egypt for Universities. So I put the um, main website links here. This Constructing the Sacred is a full digital publication that um, dives into the history of Saqqara, which is a site in Egypt that has seen many uses over thousands of years. So site reuse um, it is a big theme there. And this digital publication by Eleanor Sullivan, I think, really breaks it down. Um, and allows you to look at the history um, in a 3D and a very immersive way. So I would definitely recommend reading through it. Digital Giza um, is by Harvard and in particular, Dr. Peter Manuelian um, and his team. So what they've done uh, with this website is they've taken a lot of the archive materials that were done for different excavations at Giza um, and they've put them all um, on this digital database. So if you want a kind of view of how a lot of the um, Canopic jars and the steel lays from the old kingdom that are now in the Boston MFA, if you want a kind of a glimpse of how these objects looked when they were first found or in situ, uh, as they're called by archeologists, this is a really good site to kind of get at that. Uh, in terms of hieroglyphs, um, and in terms of, of really learning them, and again, starting with that Middle Egyptian version, um, this is a web site, so you can, it, it both has a series of lessons for you to learn that Middle 
Egyptian, but also has really helpful articles on the language and kind of overall how it um, evolved. If you are a more of a auditory learner, um, this is a YouTube channel by a practicing Egyptologist that goes over different, different aspects of um, Middle Egyptian and how it links it to different aspects of Egyptian cult culture. So it's helpful to kind of use these sources both at the same time. If you're not quite getting something through this site, there's a good chance that the Voices of, of Ancient Egypt has a video um, on it that may, you know, give it that final click um, in your brain. So when you're translating Middle Egyptian, these are some very general things to keep in mind. So first off, there's no vowels. So anytime you see a vowel in modern translations, that's um, basically an educated guess by modern Egyptologists, because we're not sure exactly how Middle Egyptian sounded. Um, in terms of how you read Middle Egyptian, a lot of the hieroglyphic signs are of people or um, animals, and the direction that those people or animals are facing, that's the direction that you um, start. So you read into the people um, or animals, and I'll show you some examples of how that works in practice a little bit later. For some of the hieroglyphs, you really also have to kind of be aware of these subtle changes. Um, because it's that detail that really matters. So for instance, um, you have what I call a regular K, which is this um, ideogram, uh, and in particular, a unilateral roll. You'll notice that it, 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 it has a little tail on either the left or the right. So that's how you know that you're looking at the regular K um, versus, the unilateral that is a dotted K, um, which is this hieroglyph here. Um, you also, similar thing, you have the unilateral um, F, which is the horned serpent. You know it's the unilateral F, which is the horned serpent, because of those little things on top of the serpent's head. Versus the um, I think its technical name is second D. I call it the underlined D, which is just the regular snake. And you know it's the underlined D or the second D because there's there's those little horns aren't there. It's just a regular snake head. So this is kind of an example of subtle changes that tell you which unilateral you're working with. Um, you also have uh, in Middle Egyptian, just like in English, there is pl pl plural um, versus singular. The way that they do that um, in Middle Egyptian is they have these series of dashes. Um, so here, and this is um, from both these, both these uh, and these, are from that step-by-step um, -step site. Uh, so this site here. Um, and I went to the part of the lesson that looks at unilaterals um, in particular for this chunk here. Uh, and then for this chunk, they have an online searchable dictionary that, that I went to. So that's where I got these words. Um, so, for instance, this word here that can be translated as soldiers or army or infantry or gang, particularly like a gang of workmen, you know it's plural because it has those multiple dashes there. Um, something else that Middle Egyptian has is something called a determinative, which is basically a picture that tells you which category that word falls into. 
but it's not meant to be read as like an alphabetical letter. So for this word here, um, you have the determinative that's here. And it's this chunk that's meant to be read as the actual hieroglyph. Uh, something that you also see in Middle Egyptian is different ways to write the same word. Um, so this is, these are both slightly different um, signs, but they, both these variants mean this, or mean those hiero glyphs. Uh, this is just down here is that singular versus plural. So the word for one lion, um, you can tell it's singular because it's just that one dash uh, versus the, the word for multiple lions. Um, and it's the three dashes. So that's plural. And then this is the determinative here. Um, this is, again, a word that I got from the dictionary on that, uh, that step by step site. Um, and as you can see, um, the meaning can change depending on the context that you're looking for. So this word can be translated in a variety of ways. It can mean walk, it can mean formal journey, or it can mean steps. And if you look, this um, comma means that this is another way to write the same word. But if you look, one is singular because it just has that one dash and the other is the plural form. So I think you, you basically use the singular or plural form depending on what meaning you want. Um, so if you're trying to say something along the lines of one formal journey or walk, singular, so this version of this word probably works better. If you're going for the context of like many steps, this word probably works better. Um, so when you're translating something, uh, don't start to tr translate with the first hieroglyph. Let your eye scan over the whole document or whole object and then start your tr translation. Um, because for some of the hieroglyph signs, uh, the same image can be multiple things depending on the context. And um, these are some examples of that. So this is again from um, that step-by-step -step site. This is from their dictionary tab. So one of the most common examples of this um, is a, a sound that's given the, 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 the current sound of neb. So N, and then we add the E, B. But the hieroglyphs, because remember, Middle Egyptian originally didn't have any vowels, um, is just that NB. And NB or Neb can mean a lot of things. It can mean Lord or Master. So one Lord or one Master in the singular form. It can also mean the word for any or all or every. So it's the same picture and whether the, the ultimate meaning depends on the context. Sometimes you are Middle Egyptian like 
English also has masculine and feminine forms for words. Um, and so if you're wanting to talk about, if you're wanting to basically say something like lady or mistress, basically it's that feminine form of that neb. So it's still that NB. So you can still see that NB there. But then you add the unilateral of T. And so this is what makes it a feminine form, nept of lady, mistress, usually, or a lot of times you see this in the context of the title, lady or mistress of the house. Uh, you can also have a sound ideogram um, versus a determinative. So a sound ideogram is basically a picture that is meant to be read as one of the Middle Egyptian, uh, we would say alphabet letters. And the most one of the most common forms of this that you'll see is, again, we've we've approximated the sound as per p e r, um, but the original Middle Egyptian is just p r, and so that per or p r can either be a sound ideogram, so alphabetical, like in terms of our language, roughly equivalent to our alphabetical language, like in this case. So the word for house or temple or palace, um, and you can tell it's one house or temple or palace, i.e. the singular form, because it just has that one dash. Um, but PR or per uh, can also be a determinative. So it can be that picture that tells you what general class of objects that word falls into, but you don't tra translate it as a letter. And so that's what, what this example is. So it's a house, a sanctuary, a quarter, i.e. of town. So this is J w y t and so that picture because you notice it's the same picture in this in this word is functioning as the determinative because it tells you that this word is in the category for some type of dwelling or building Then you can also have, like we've talked about, the singular plural forms. So how does the plural form for houses work? Prit. So it's that PR. So in this case, that PR is, is a sound ideogram. Y. T. And this is the P, this, this is the R part of that P, R. And this is the determinative that tells you this word is a word for a building or a st structure. It's plural because there's more than one dash. And this picture is that sound ideogram. So this is what I mean by these subtle changes are, are key to a lot of the meaning and the context is key to a lot of the meaning. So this is also why you don't start to translate as soon as you see the first picture or first image. You let your eye kind of wander over the whole thing um, first. Because if you start to translate right away, you're going to do a lot of crossing things out. Um, so, like I said before, uh, we also have instances where the same word 
can be multiple things depending on the context. So a very common example of this that you'll see is the word ka, which can be the word for a bull. So ka, ka. Um, so it's the same sp spelling. Or it can be the word that sometimes is translated as soul or mobile soul or spirit or essence, personality or fortune, maybe kingship. And the key to figuring out which of these translations you'll use is that determinative or sometimes lack of a determinative. So these are different ways up here of saying ka, uh, like a bull or, you know, cow. So this is the determinative because it's that picture of a bull or cow um, versus the ka, that spirit or soul or something like that. Um, and you see a different determinative here. Uh, and this is a common word that you'll see on steel lay, and in particular on funerary steel lay. Okay, so I talked a little bit before about how the terminology that we use for the different periods of Egyptian history has really been imposed by modern day Egyptologists and is artificial to some extent. Um, but because these time spans that we're dealing with are so vast, um, we sort of have to agree to kind of that artificial boundary so we can argue about all the other things. Um, and then I alluded, or I talked briefly about if you look at Egyptian, or if you look at objects from ancient Egypt and their written sources, they have a completely different way of dating things. Um, and so that's what I'm, what I'm going to talk a little bit more about now. Uh, so the way that Egyptians tended to date things, very broadly speaking, um, is they would say the name of the ruler that was on the throne. They would give the approximate regional year or like what basically how many years she or he was into their reign. And sometimes they would give uh, the season that that document or that object was made in. So this is a, this is a translation of uh, a steel lay that was made uh, in the Middle Kingdom uh, for one of the royal forts in the general area of what the, what the Egyptians called Nubia. Um, and so the fort uh, is the Semina forts. Um, and the ruler that this was was made under is Senator Rosaret the Third, who is a Middle Kingdom fair. Role. But these are the important things that date this object in the Egyptian sense, and then modern day e Egypt. Egyptologists use this information to extract the absolute calendar year dates. So this steel lay was made in the year eight. So the eighth year that Senator Rosret the third was on the throne. Um, and then it, it gives some of basically the, the formalistic titles and like royal terminology. And then it gives that personal ruler's name and uh, doesn't give it here but sometimes like I said you'll also see the season named that the document or that the object was made in. This is an, an this is from another middle kingdom object and it's from a funerary steel lay. So again, it starts with regional year 17. So whoever 
is on the throne. It's the 17th year that they're being um, a, a ruler of Egypt. Uh, and then it gives one of those personal names. So Horus of living birth, the young god Kepa, Kepa Kare, which we know is one of the names of Senorasaret the uh, first. So these are, again, the way that you see the Egyptian dates. And then it's from this information that modern day Egyptologists abstract or extract and kind of figure out those absolute calendar year dates are as close as they can get. This is uh, a link um, for a lecture through that YouTube channel. And it just talks in more depth about uh, the ancient Egyptian way of dating things versus um, our dates. I think somebody is home. So I'm going to um, end this, but hopefully I will see you guys later on. <laughs>